to another week of OSHIP. This week we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, leadership. You've heard about me talk about this time and time again, week after week on OSHIP, but I've got a special guest in this week to really kind of challenge me and inspire me while I hopefully challenge and inspire him. And that person is called Scott Monty. Now, I have known of Scott since about 2008 when he was the global head of social media for the Ford Motor Company. I'd seen his publications and I'd seen you know, speaking you know, things from him, but I'd never had a chance to meet him in person until a couple years ago when I was lucky enough to be introduced to him. Now I'm actually lucky enough to call him a colleague as he's part of Chameleon Collective where he does interim uh, communication leadership roles. But he also happens to have a really awesome new podcast called Timeless Leadership. And when I discovered what he was doing, we decided we had to get together and do a joint episode of OSHIP and Timeless Leadership together. So this week's episode is going to be available in podcast form on his, on his podcast, and you can watch it live here on OSHIP and video. And so our big challenge to each other is we're going to address 10, maybe more, super important leadership questions that need to be addressed. He's picked five, I've picked five, and we're going to see how this rolls out. So with that, welcome to another week of OSHIP. Scott, so good to have you on the show. Freddie, my friend, it is great to be here. And in honor of the maritime theme of O-Ship, I have worn a maritime themed bow tie for you today. I like that. Very, very classy. Looking, Thank looking you. very, very sharp. <laughs> I, I, I have to ask, how many of these bow ties do you own? Uh, approximately 142. Yeah, approximately. <laughs> well, <laughs> that seems pretty, I, uh, pretty precise for for approximately, in my opinion. <laughs> people have people have asked me for many years. But first of all, I have probably around three hundred and fifty neckties. But you wear a bow tie once, and you're suddenly branded as the bow tie guy. So it after I. Absolutely. So after I left Ford, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna just embrace this. I'm, I'm gonna live it. It's it's different from anyone else. Yeah, I, uh, I, th I think with a bow tie, you you look like you you're an independent thinker, and I'm okay being. Uh, I, I uh, love that, and you're certainly an independent that way. thinker. It, Thank it, you. Uh, it, it outclasses my uh, my uh, flat cap obsession, where I think <laughs> yeah, I'm up to twenty something. But yeah, 142. That's the real deal. We've but, all got our things. You know, um, I know you well. But I think it would be super useful if you told our audience a little bit about uh, your background um, so they understand what you kind of bring to the table in this leadership conversation. Sure. Well, I mean, you mentioned I was uh, global head of social media and digital communications at Ford. That's kind of where I gained my notoriety. But interestingly, I hadn't had a communications job before that. I actually came up uh, through the marketing world, I worked for uh, agencies and consultancies for a number of years. Um, I've got my MBA with a concentration in healthcare management, along with a master's in medical science. And as an undergrad, I was a classics major. So put that all together, what it means is uh, I've got a keen understanding of uh, human behaviors and, uh, and human nature, and it helps me help other leaders become better at what they do, particularly through communicating. I love that. I, actually, I had no idea about the the medical aspect to your background. That's really interesting. You you, you always uh, con continue to uh, surprise me uh, with some of your interesting background. I'm like an onion. <laughs> so, Freddie, for the the benefit of my listeners, as we're going to uh, make this a dual show, why don't you explain a little bit about your background and how you came to be leading Chameleon Collective? Okay, no no problem. I um. So for those of you who don't know me, and actually kind of fun for some a long time with ship listeners, a quick refresher, I'm a, a lifelong serial entrepreneur. I, uh, I've been starting companies since the mid-90s. Uh, I had my first CEO role uh, when I was 19. I was a uh, god-awful CEO, but uh, I, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I just thought it was better than I give myself credit for, but looking back in time it makes me cringe a little bit. 
Um, I've been a CEO um, several more times since then. Um, I've also held uh, C-suite level roles uh, in uh, I've been a CMO of a media company, the CMO of a facial biometrics company, the head of digital for the largest swing set manufacturer in North America, uh, the head of digital and, and marketing for Nixon, the watch brand. I was the chief digital officer for Bugaboo, uh, the baby stroller brand. So I've held a lot of different um, C-suite level roles. And in my role at Chameleon Collective, we provide uh, you know, a lot of interim leadership roles to uh, various typically private equity backed companies. So I think I have some really, really good visibility into what makes um, leaders successful or not successful. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. What a lineup, Freddie. You're such a slacker. Um, <laughs> yeah. When you when you think about that breadth of, of leadership roles and those those different kinds of companies, did you have a favorite among all of those? And what was it? Oh, God, you know, um, I really enjoyed uh, they all had kind of different impacts on me in, a, in, a, in an evolutionary kind of way. So, um, you know, I think about some of the earlier roles uh, of being a leader. I think you're developing some of your base skills. And and so um, I, there was a company that I had um, earlier in my career called I Chameleon. Um, I think that's where I really kind of uh, mastered or like to believe I mastered the craft of, of marketing and advertising and was the first kind of company that I, that I had that worked with big brands. And, and it was, um, I loved it because the culture was so strong. But then you could look at something like um, the last interim leadership role I did, which was a, a chief digital officer for Bugaboo, but more importantly, I worked with Bain Capital. And for me, that was really working in kind of the, the, um, the, the big boy leagues of the private equity world. And, and it forced me, um, and it did full disclosure, I, I, you know, I, I dropped out of college after a couple of months. It, it was almost like uh, you know, going through university and really, really forcing me to, um, to push myself. Um, I guess when I'm hearing myself say that, I, I guess the, the leadership roles I've enjoyed the most are the ones that push me to my limits the most, um, uh, you know, where versus even sometimes you can say a company isn't... Um, uh, maybe there were good experiences or bad experiences because the culture of the company is success of the company. But I guess when I reflect b back in time, when I'm not living those good or bad moments, I, I tend to reflect on, on how they how they changed me. Maybe that's why I like Chameleon so much. <laughs> that, that makes perfect sense. And, and look, I think having the time and the ability to reflect uh, is is such a, an important part of leadership and and we tend to push ourselves so far and so quickly all the time that the time for reflection often gets pushed aside because it doesn't feel like it's essential and yet as you've just demonstrated it's probably one of the most essential things for mm -hmm. leaders to do keep keep evolving and keep keep learning so um, you know, as I kind of teed us up in the in the beginning of the show we've got at least five questions each uh, we have not warned each other what the questions are going to be, so we, we wanted to put each other on the spot a little bit. I don't think we've done, uh, hopefully I, you haven't given me anything so, <laughs> so crazy that this whole show goes off the rails, but I think we're going to be, they're going to be okay. Um, and I'm, I'm really intrigued uh, to, to see where this goes and what you've got for me. So I'm, I'm, I, I think, you know, that we go, the guest gets first rights. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think that's the polite thing to do. So I, I encourage you to hear what you think are an essential leadership question, Scott. Well, Freddie, you are a gentleman and, um, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, look, pe people are expecting a show here, so I'm, I'm going to give it to them. Um, so hang on to your, to your hat, to your flat top, um, your flat cap. So <laughs> let's, let's start out with, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll take any haircut I can get at this point. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so why, why don't we start out along the lines of uh, something that's on a lot of people's minds, not only leaders, but on employees as we are working our way through the, hopefully the end of the pandemic here. And people are thinking about office arrangements, you know, people have been remote for a long time. And I know that's kind of the, the chameleon collective mentality is, is remote leadership. Um, what does the post pandemic workforce need to plan for and what kind of leadership is going to be needed during that transition? Uh, I love that question. Uh, so, uh, you know, there was a lot of changes we had to make 
during the pandemic. We will live them. I'm not going to hammer them to death uh, because I think it was, um, you know, it's such recent memory for us. Obviously, the biggest change being where remote uh, work, where something you know I've been doing for five years, um, and a lot of community collective has was was really new for a lot of a lot of folks. Um, I think what's really uh, changed and need, people need to think about post pandemic is the reality is that there's no going back to normal. Um, I think that people need to plan for um, changes in, in people's emotional state. I think that you're going to see people at different ends of a, of a spectrum as they return to work. I think uh, some people don't really even want to go back to you know what was normal, right? Other people you know, can't get back in the door of the office fast enough. All of those people were impacted in... Um, De certainly at some emotional level, whether they recognize that or not. It's impacted them professionally, uh, whether they recognize it or not. It's changed the way they work. Um, it has um, uh, you know, probably changed the way that they perceive how they interact with other folks. And I think really great leaders are going to have to have a really high um, emotional EQ and, and extreme degrees of empathy to navigate this because if they just put the blinders on and say, right, let's get back to business, I don't think that's going to be a very effective. Um, I think maybe with some of the workforce, uh, but can you can any leader afford to leave 20, 30 percent of people behind or allow 20 or 30 or even higher percentage of their business to start to become um, ineffective because they're not on the same game plan? So there's there's um, a lot of additional communication that had to be had. There needs to be a lot of, um, when I say communication, I mean leadership, talking to the team, keeping people communicating, getting people realigned, um, and probably um, listening to what people want and being willing to change the way a business works, not only in terms of listening to your customers, but also listening to your workforce um, so that you can create a new normal a new normal that people are comfortable with at a minimum and, and a, preferably a new normal that people are excited about. Let's take all the, the positive side of the last year and really hone it into something beautiful. And I, and I think that's totally possible. Yeah, I, I think you've, you've nailed it there with the listening and empathy. You know, uh, I, I boil it down to a very simple kind of analogy or, or story that people can understand. When it comes to uh, going to the office, when we used to go to the office, uh, because we had to, that was the, all we knew and it was what was required before we had to be more flexible. Um, the hour long commute for one person um, might be a way to unwind and get ready for that transition, while the hour long commute for another person might be stress filled because they're trying to get to a little league game or home for dinner or, uh, you know, see some see the kids before they get to bed. Uh, so it, it, it impacts people in many different ways. And I think it's, it becomes more complex, not less, and requires even more uh, empathy out of our leaders. Here, here. Um, so one of the questions that I've got lined up for you is uh, you know, you've again, worked in a large organization like Ford. You've counseled a lot of other people as a communication leader. Um, and I think you see a lot of leaders are driven by short-term results. I've worked at publicly traded companies. I've seen this uh, firsthand. Um, so people, you know, obsessing on what the market will do or what quarterly earnings might look like. How does a leader reconcile this need, but still think about strategic long-term uh, challenges? Yeah, this is the perennial problem. And, and we've let uh, Wall Street essentially whipsaw us and and when a leader is is simply reacting rather than being more proactive and more strategic that's when it gets dangerous uh responding to every little whim it's it's like uh, the shiny object syndrome that we see where um you know a leader sees a, the the latest burgeoning platform whether it's TikTok or clubhouse or whatever and say well we got to get on that well it, it it's not fair to your to your audience it's not fair to your team unless you have a, a compelling vision that everyone shares, that you communicate about regularly, and that you're executing against. You know, if if you retain that original vision, and and the board comes to you and says, "Well, you know, we we've seen a a drop of, of uh, three and a half percent in the last quarter. We need to do something about this." Say, "Look, here's the plan. Uh, 
and we are on the plan and and we're constantly crafting a better plan we're, we're improving what we have but that doesn't mean that we veer you know 90 degrees to the left because of some um you know market blip understand if you know market conditions have drastically changed if there's you know a pandemic or a tsunami that takes out half your supply chain or something well of course you have to you have to tack with that but if it's just a, a financial kind of thing and it has nothing it has no impact to your strategic direction it's imperative that the leader double down on ensuring that everyone is on the plan is aligned with the vision and is executing the way they should and look Jeff Bezos was able to do this for what two decades with Amazon before it turned to profit. It's possible if you have the fortitude and if you have the long-term vision. That's such an actually incredible example. It's really hard to um, almost, uh, you know, uh, what's it, give pair justice to you know how long it took him to get there, but there was a you know big serious long-term plan there, and now is you know. The, one of the most valuable companies is the most valuable company in the world um, well, look, and, 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 and still growing like wildfire. Um, it absolutely is. Look, there was just a, an article in the New York Times about the millennial lifestyle subsidy that's going away, that Uber and Lyft rides are going to get more expensive, Airbnb stays are going to get more expensive because these companies are tired of losing money and it's time that they they basically back their business model with something that nears Shocker. profitability. Yeah, make money right. now. <laughs> I know, right? I, I was never a big fan of the whole like Silicon you know, Valley-esque, like, you know, it's, it was all about scale. Obviously, you know, a lot of people made money doing that, but it just, um, I don't know, I'm too much of an entrepreneur and I guess I bootstrap too many businesses um, uh, to, really, to really appreciate that. Yeah. I'm going back to this long-term uh, versus short-term uh, goal challenge though. You know, I witnessed this firsthand at, at Sapient uh, when we were growing just, you know, at absolute crazy speed. Uh, there was times, you know, we were adding in, uh, you know, 600 new hires a quarter at, at one point. You know, my agency, when we joined Sapient, were less than 100 people. So it's like trying to imagine like hiring that many, you know, that many folks on a quarterly basis. And and it was I personally think it was was messing with the culture. It was impacting the culture. You're adding you're adding too many fish into the fishbowl and not letting people acclimate. Um, but I, I I know that the the CEO and the leadership was extremely challenged by again what what was what was Wall Street going to say? And they were they were being driven to make short very short term things to satisfy shareholders, and it wasn't in the best long term interest of the company. Yeah. Um, well, related to that, Freddie, I think one of the things you've probably seen uh, in your time in uh, interim roles is particularly with CMOs. We've seen that the tenure of CMOs continually shorten to, to where I think the average tenure of the CMO is about 18 months now. Yeah. And when they come in and they're expected to make strategic decisions about marketing, 18 months really isn't enough time to execute on a, on a full strategy. So where do you think the opportunity lies and what can be done uh, with respect to ensuring that CMOs have the full runway to accomplish what they need to accomplish? I'm going to give an unusual and odd, poten potentially perceived as odd answer to this um, for people who maybe aren't in a CMO or chief digital officer role, um, like I've been a couple of times. And I may be projecting myself a little bit here, but, but I can at least give you my two cents on this. Um, I feel like when, when you are a marketing leader, obviously growth is one of the big key metrics they're looking for. Um, I think that every marketer or you know, e-commerce leader, but any, a commercially focused growth leader has a bag of tricks. And, and you're going to have some, some of these leaders um, have a, a great bag of tricks. They come in, they deploy those bag of tricks, they yield incredible results in year one, they yield pretty good results in year two, maybe as good, but then after a couple of years, your, your, your kind of go-to moves, you know, your, your, uh, uh, you know, what it was a Zoolander kind of blue steel, or whatever it is, your, you know, your, your big move, like you've kind of used it up. And I personally think there's why this kind of like cyclical sense of like these marketing leaders, uh, moving from company to company. Um, at the same time, I think there are some really incredible CMOs out there that maybe their real value is like, you know, they, they've shown like, hey, it's it, for me, it's about how they manage the team, 
uh, how they drive leadership, how they build an organization around them, how they continue to recruit people with new bags of tricks. Um, and I think those are the people that end up having uh, longevity. I, I don't think it's necessarily about um, the company or in some cases the private equity firm that may back them or the shareholders or the CEO or the board giving people that, that runway. I, I think people are using up their bag of tricks and they, and they, and they don't necessarily know um, what to do after that. Um, you know, and then I think there's some people as well uh, that maybe you only want to stick around for a couple of years. Maybe it's fun to use your bag of tricks. And then when it's, when it gets a little bit more administrative and you're having to kind of, um, you know, do that more like org, org structure and, 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 and just straight leadership, um, maybe those types of folks get, get bored. Uh, again, I, I probably an unexpected answer to, to this, but um, it's just kind of my analysis after working and dealing with just so, so many uh, CMOs at this point. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a really astute observation, Freddie. And, and and look, I think there are different kinds of leaders for different uh, phases of a company's development. You've got the founder, you've got the, the administrator, you've got the innovator, you've got all kinds of different aspects of this. And, and sure, we all have portions of those aspects as part of our uh, our psyche, our makeup. But to your point, finding the person that brings out the best elements in the team, that's exactly what leaders are supposed to do. A leader is there not to be an individual contributor, but to make the rest of the team shine. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody I, I heard from, a uh, guy who's actually uh, the founder of uh, one of these new social audio companies, racket.com. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, somebody uh, once told him, my job as the leader is to help, uh, is to make your job easier your job is to make my job harder, right? So, so the leader clears the hurdles and makes it easy for somebody to accomplish what they do. And then they come back with even greater challenges for that leader to step up to. So I think it's just a, a wonderful way of thinking about yeah. how uh, leaders fill those roles. I love that. I, I, I've got some questions saved up for later that I think are kind of getting into more of these leadership qualities and dying to ask you. But since you asked me about uh, CMOs, I want to ask you uh, about what it means to be a, a, a communications leader. So, uh, earned media is clearly a powerful component of the media mix, but the function of communication is, is far more expansive than media heads, and I think a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. So, can you talk a bit about the importance of communication as a strategic function and the chief communication officer's role as a confidant and, you know, let's call it, advisor to the CEO? Yeah, I, I, this is uh, a perennial favorite for me, Freddie. Uh, too often, uh, the communications and PR team uh, just gets reduced to PR. Um, and uh, the, the, the question is, you know, can you get us on the front page of the Wall Street Journal <laughs> or the New York Times? Which I'm is probably the equivalent of doing this, by uh, the way. So. <laughs> we, uh, it's, it's Fantasy. Of course, you want to do that, and 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 we all want to do that. But it's it's the PR equivalent of saying, "Can you make me a viral video?" Um, <laughs> it's my pet you, peeve. I understand. You remember those days? Talking my language. Exactly. So um, that that's an important part of communications, but it's not the only part. You know, a chief communications officer really is as a strategic counsel to the CEO, and we're seeing more instances of the CCO. Uh, and I don't mean chief creative officer, I mean chief communications <laughs> officer. Verification. <laughs> right. Uh, reporting directly to the CEO rather than up through the CMO. And that transition actually happened while I was at Ford. My boss, the chief communications officer, reported to the CMO at the time, which was Jim Farley, who, oh, by the way, is now Ford's CEO. Uh, but there was a transition where the CCO reported directly to the CEO. And what that did is it created a line of sight for the CEO that helped him understand uh, what was happening out in the field, right? Not only in the industry, but in the world at large. Um, it became um, an important part of guarding our reputation and building our reputation as a result. Um, it was an important part of how we, we talk to employees and to uh, union members and uh, customers and all of the stakeholders. Communications really owns all of that and is the nerve center of what's going on in the company. And if you can use that as, to your advantage, right, whether it's for speech writing or uh, television appearances or talking to employees or addressing a particular body of, of stakeholders, it's important to have the messaging straight. It's important to be consistent. And again, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier about having that compelling vision having the plan and communicating the plan to everyone. That's the job of a chief communications council. 
a small tangent, but I'm intrigued. Do you think there's a certain size of company that you need to be at before maybe you're not having a chief communication officer, but, but before you really start weaving communications into your overall strategy? It's a good question because I've dealt with companies of all sizes, um, all, all the way up to a Fortune One company. You can look that up. Um, <laughs> we all know who that is. <laughs> but the importance here is if, if you're going to do communications, it needs to be aligned with the marketing team. And I think starting early is more important because there are so many instances of of legacy companies where you've got communications and you've got marketing and never the twain shall meet. And even at Ford, we had, we had challenges for that, but we overcame them. And it was largely through digital communications where we saw that bridge where we could say, okay, we've had, oh, I don't know, a, 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 a product recall. And we can we can use our earned media as we have to to make these announcements and respond to the the news. But we can also put paid media against it to amplify it so it goes out to more people, All right? So there's this this symbiotic relationship between the two teams that I think they would benefit from if they started it earlier rather than later. Great answer. Very interesting. Um, Cool. Uh, I think it's. I think so I, up. I'm, I'm up now. My gosh, I got to go back to my notes here. Um, so, look, I think one of the things we see with elevating people to leadership roles is typically it's the the superior individual performer, right? Somebody is a really good, uh, whether uh, they're a designer, or a product uh, developer, uh, financial whiz, etc. That they're elevated to a leadership role, um, but. We, it, it's, it's kind of an unspoken thing that leadership is really about more of the soft skills rather than the hard skills. It's more qualitative rather than quantitative. So my question is, how can we recognize and communicate the importance of soft skills as we develop leaders? Mm, that's a good one. Um, yeah, to your point, that's great because I think you know, it's easy to get the metrics of, of – Hey, great! You know the top line revenue or retention and all these kind of you know, business intelligence dashboards. Uh, but I think um, you know qualifying people's soft skills is um, is is a bit is a bit trickier. Um, I think that what some of the ways that we can do that is, you know, I think I, I, let me divide this into two groups. I think you've got one side of this when you talk about recognition in a measurable way. So that could be. Um, you know, the, you're getting employee feedback, you've got, you know, internal surveys, you've got Glassdoor, and there's these people who are literally trying to force a measurable approach onto quantifying these, these soft skills. Is the CEO liked? Is the CEO appreciated, for example? Um, but I think there's another side of it. And, and this is the side that, that I'm, that I'm um, far more passionate about, which is Honestly, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, uh, how people are measured, taking all the quantitative you know, BS out the window for a second. And um, you know, the culture of a business, uh, which comes at top down from leadership, probably has, uh, in my opinion, and certainly in my own, my own leadership style, um, probably the most profound <clears throat> impact on the, on the business. Um, I think you can have people that are are brilliant, or incredibly smart, or incredibly educated, or incredibly experienced, um, but they can't seem to connect with people. I've seen people that I think are um, are just brilliant, but people people won't follow them because they don't believe in them. They don't mm. trust them. You know, if you think about, um, uh, you know, I'm using a kind of a military or sports reference, but military being a good one. Um, I think when you think about kind of, you know, a, a captain or a sergeant kind of charging into battle and other people being willing to kind of, you know, r run behind them, there is a trust there. And, and that trust is um, very primal. It's does this person mean me well? And if as a leader, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about life or death, uh, you know, in this case, but sometimes it might feel that way with work. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, people going, look, is this, is this person really care about me? Does this feel uh, rehearsed? Is this sincere? Yeah, they're telling me they care about me, but do, you know, do they, do they care or am I just another cog in the wheel? Um, and, I, and I personally think that when people stop feeling like they are cared about 
or recognized or that that group does not have their best interests at heart. And again, very simple and very primal. That's when people move on, you know, yeah. the, and, and so what is the value of retention? And, and, you know, the, you, the, you don't want to be in the game of trying to keep your best people where the only metric that people can quantify you by is money and your comp package. And if you've gotten down to that spot, I personally don't think you're at a very, very good place as a company. It's one of the bigger challenges that happens as a company continues to get larger and larger and larger, and you've got you know tens of thousands of employees in some cases. It's then, and, you know, the you, are you breeding a culture with your mid managers and your regional managers and your team managers to to ha make sure that they understand like we care about you. This is the culture of the business. You care about them. We go out of our way to help people, um, and. And I think that I think that is is probably more of a driving factor in the long term success of a company than, you know, man, we killed it. You can bring in a bunch of mercenaries and kill and kill the numbers in the short term, in my opinion. Uh, but they're mercenaries at the end of the day. Um, and and, you know, again, you could argue that Chameleon Collective are mercenaries sometimes. And we come in and we and we yield these kind of big results for people. But they have uh, companies have to be able to build this long-term culture of success and, 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 and family. Um, you know, it doesn't, um, family may not be achievable for everyone, but if nothing else, this, this sense of, of meeting people well. Yeah, I, I think that's so important, particularly when you're spending so many of your waking hours at work. It is like a second family or can be like a second family in some cases. Yeah, I, it's, uh, again, I, I just, I can't stress that, um, I think I've seen people that aren't aren't the brightest people in the world, but with incredible soft skills, incredible communication skills, incredible empathy, incredibly incredible so, you know emotional EQ, be far better leaders than you know potentially some Ivy League uh, you know grad. I'm not trying to single out Ivy League by the way. I'd love to have an Ivy League degree, but you know what I mean. I think people that that uh, that assume that their success is built in maybe from from something like that. Um, yeah. So I think this is uh, an inspiring uh, subject. So I'm going to ask you an inspiring question. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, what is the most inspiring thing you've ever uh, seen a leader do? And I'd love to know specifically why that was inspiring to you, because you, know, you could argue it's uh, there's just because it's uh, the change. Maybe they change the world makes them inspiring, but maybe there's a different lens that that Mr. Scott Monty looks through. <laughs> well, I, I think it, 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 interestingly, Freddie, it's going to dovetail with what you were just talking about. It, it's about uh, these these behaviors uh, that we see exhibited. And, and let me just, let me start off with um, a, a story. And I don't know if this is a true story or if it's apocryphal, but I think it's enough for us to understand the personality. Um, years ago, back when Steve Jobs was alive, and you know, you talk about a leader who has been able to do amazing things, or who was able to do amazing things with his company, um, you know, came back to Apple after having been fired and brought it back from the brink and made it the behemoth that it is today through powerful design and emotions that connect with people. And yet, at the Apple headquarters, when someone <laughs> entered an elevator and Steve Jobs was in that elevator, uh, he is supposed to have turned to them and said, what do you do for me? And this is just like a regular frontline employee. And they're like stammering and, you know, they're so nervous. And he really put them on the spot. And he's he was a, a pretty formidable guy. Um, and thankfully, the headquarters at Apple at the time was only about four stories tall. So there, it wasn't a long elevator ride. <laughs> Contrast that with an experience I had with I th who I think is probably the most inspiring uh, leader, American business leader of the last half century, Alan Mulally, who I had the great fortune to work directly with. Um, again, because my boss was his chief counsel for communication. So I saw an awful lot of Alan. It was take your child to work day. And I had, a, I had my two young sons with me at the time. They were maybe, uh, maybe eight and six. And there was this big event that we went to in an auditorium. Uh, Alan got up there and just took questions from all the kids in the audience. And my, my eight-year-old, he had his hand way up. He's waving his hand. He wanted to ask a question. Alan didn't get to him. So, you know, we, we left and we went to the, the company cafeteria because the boys wanted their hot dogs and tater tots that they love so much at the, the company cafeteria. And we finished lunch and we come out of lunch and I get a call on my phone. Uh, hey, Scott, this is Amy. Uh, Amy is Alan's executive assistant. 
Uh, she says, where are you right now? I said, oh, we're, we're downstairs, just outside the lobby. She goes, can you come up to Alan's office right now? <laughs> okay. So we got summoned up to the CEO's office at the Ford Motor Company. So I bring uh, my two boys up there and Alan's standing in the doorway. You know, we, we enter his, the, the antechamber and he's standing in the doorway in his office and he's got his hands on his hips and he goes, boys, come on in. And we go into his office and he sits down with us and he said, I didn't have a chance to get to your question, but I saw you out there in the audience and I know your dad does such a great job for the company here. I wanted you to see exactly where all the action happens. I, and he sat down and he talked with them. He uh, he asked what their mom's name was, and he took out a piece of uh, Ford letterhead and he drew a big heart. And uh, he he uh, he, he uh, inscribed a note to my wife about what fine young boy she had. He invited us all behind his desk and had a photographer take our picture with him behind his desk. And then he sent the boys on the way with a couple of goodie bags with a bunch of Ford tchotchkes. Now that's all. Awesome. Look, it's a, it was a simple gesture. It took 10 minutes out of his schedule. But guess what? He left an indelible impression, not only on my kids, but on me as an employee, watching this happen, watching a leader do something that was so minuscule and, and so unrelated to the bottom line of what happened at Ford Motor Company. And yet I now have, and it's not just because of this, but it's because of consistent behavior, uh, a loyalty to Alan Mulally, the leader, Alan Mulally, the person, um, as a result of that kind of uh, expressed behavior. And it was consistent with the way that he acted and talked every single day at Ford Motor Company. I love that. Uh, it's, a, it's a really a beautiful story. And, and it's, if I, I suspected that if I didn't say you, like filter with you, I knew I was hoping we get, and I kind of knew I'd maybe get some magic out of you there. Because it's easy to say, like, you, you can pick these big kind of famous people and go, oh, they've given 10% of all their company profit to uh, feeding the homeless or whatever. But I think there's, I think there's magic in the little moments. And one of the things you said that I really loved um, was uh, consistency. There was the, it, you know, when you, uh, as a marketer, when you talk about like, you know, what's a brand, a brand is the kind of culmination of all those little moments, all those little touch points that make up your combined perception of a, a person or a company or a business or product or whatever. And, and I love that it's like you're seeing, you're saying, look, this was just one a particularly magical one, but a very consistent, um, uh, you know, m number of engagements you have. And, and then out of interest, do you feel that he mean, mean, means you well? Does that make sense to you that, that he would protect you and that he had your best interests at heart? A absolutely. I mean, there is, uh, I, I still stay in touch with Alan. And uh, there was a, uh, a guest on my show, uh, Marilyn Gist, who wrote uh, a book called The Extraordinary Power of Leader Humility. And uh, Alan wrote one of the chapters in the book. And uh, and I interviewed Alan. He's actually uh, my next guest on my show. And look at look at what Alan wrote in the book. He said, Scott, to one of my favorite leaders that lives and leads with humility, Alan Mulally. And then he drew his little signature airplane there. Hey, that, I like the airplane. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I thought you would. Uh, Alan isn't doing this for everybody, you know, and he's got his working together management system that he talks about in this book now. Um, that he 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 lives this kind of stuff and believes it, and I'm sure I am I, I am positive I am not the only one he does this with, and that's what makes it so special that he's able to scale this in a way that that makes empathy. Uh, scalable, uh, I, I guess. Uh, everyone he get, he comes in touch with, and and there's a story in in uh, the book American Icon, which was about uh, the recovery of Ford Motor Company. How when they recruited Alan, uh, the board members uh, visited him in Seattle, and he walked with them after a discussion in in the hotel suite, like down to get some coffee, mm -hmm. and everybody on the street knew Alan, and he greeted them with the same level of joy and happiness, whether they were a college student. Uh, a, a janitor uh, or another uh, icon of business. And that's just the way he is. I love that. So good. So, <laughs> Freddie, I, I want to, as we've talked about this inspiring kind of leadership, you know, uh, you have inspired people along the way, but do you perceive yourself so. as a great leader? And, and what do you think your best and worst qualities are? Ooh, awkward. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I'd like to believe I'm a good leader. 
you know, uh, am I a great leader? I don't know. Um, you know, I wish there were things that I had uh, had done where uh, maybe I felt uh, uh, more prepared or, you know, could go back and do things, um, you know, a different way, business decisions or whatever. But um, I don't know. Is that really the definition of, of leadership? Maybe those were just intellectual challenges. Um, I think that uh, my 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 best quality I'd like to believe is that I, that I do believe I also connect with people and that I do, and I genuinely, genuinely care about people. And I know anyone that knows me or is interacting with me knows that that's real and that it's not a brand, you know, it's not a show or whatever. That's, that's, that's who I am. And I lead with that. And I, and I feel very strongly that, um, that the reason that I've had um, a lot of good fortune in my life is because I pay that out into the universe and I, and I always try and pay it forward uh, even when I have no expectations of getting anything back. And I find that, um, that the universe does pay me back and, and then some and, and that it, you know, it's all very cyclical. So really a, a big believer that you know, the, the more you give, the more, the more you get. Um, and, and I very much see myself in service to uh, the team, um, you know, when, when I have a team that is working for me, I, I'm, I'm there to protect them. I'm there to work for them. And, and to, like you just kind of described earlier, like unblock problems for them, um, but to let them be effective in their roles. Um, now on the flip to this, uh, what is my worst quality? This will be hard to narrow down. Um, <laughs> I'm very impulsive. I've gotten a lot better, a lot better with age. Um, I, I get uh, that enthusiasm uh, that I have. You know, some people kind of said, "Hey, my, my enthusiasm can be uh, a little infectious," uh, which is a good, you know, I think is meant in a good way. Uh, it, my enthusiasm, uh, combined with a very healthy OCD, uh, can uh, can lead me to do stuff like I don't know. Get an idea. I'm quite technical, so I get ideas for the company, and all, I've done this with all my businesses. On like, a, you know, Wednesday, I'll tell someone about it. Like, oh, I saw the coolest thing. I think we should implement it. And they're like, "That's great. We should roadmap that." And then they'll like, they'll show up on Monday. I'm like, "Yeah, I worked on it all weekend. I said it live. I ran it. I, I put it live this morning. Should I have not done that? I think I broke some stuff. Half the company can't get email. I'm sorry. Can we fix it? So, I, and I think I've had at least a couple of those in my in my career. So yeah, I I, I kind of I run a little fast sometimes, uh, which is it. Again, it has served me well in a lot of instances, but it's definitely uh, led, me, uh, led me to have some fairly embarrassing, <laughs> fairly embarrassing moments over the years. That's great. Hey, hey, progress, right? I mean, even if you fall on your face, you're moving forward. Yeah, I, I definitely, uh, maybe that's the startup guy in me. I, I don't know. I, I am getting, I am getting better at slowing down a little bit on, on yeah. this, on this front, but um, you know, and, and also I should acknowledge as a leader as well, that can be frustrating for, for, for your team. So, you know, for, for constantly, I think it's always meant with good intentions, but I think I sometimes unintentionally uh, create problems for them. And on a cheerful note, all of those people now have a documented video of me admitting this for the first time ever. And if they don't watch any of this episode, I'm sure that some of them will get just this clip and then send it back to me. <laughs> Every once in a while, just to remind me, maybe maybe the ones who really know me, they might do it even before they can. They be like, "Oh, he's a bit enthusiastic about this one." Should probably send him that clip from that O ship episode with that Scott Monty. <laughs> <laughs> see if it see if it uh, slows him down uh, a little bit. So, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So so um, so let's let's uh, flip this on it on its uh, head a little bit. So okay, you've asked me if you think I'm a good a good leader. What do you think are the most essential qualities of a great leader? Oh boy, there there are many. And look, I don't think uh, that everyone has to have all of these. Um, but th that's part of what my show, Timeless Leadership, is about. And I look, I started by looking at. Um, 10 virtues that the ancient Greeks identified uh, in leaders uh, or in just in people. Uh, but I think they, they translate well to leaders. They are humility, wisdom, justice, fortitude, love, self-control, positivity, hard work, integrity, and gratitude. Right. And, and, and just to, to piece a couple of those, uh, you know, break a couple of those apart, 
Freddie. I think um, you know what you were just talking about with respect to uh, your your um, uh, brashness in in looking to get something done. That that really comes down to uh, patience or self control, and and I think that that's something that needs to be learned. We get so excited about things, we get so passionate about them, and that is great. That's exactly what we want. But to be able to temper ourselves and say, okay, well, is this is is the time right? Is the team ready for this? Uh, have I have I laid the groundwork that needs to be laid before I do something? That takes a lot of self control and a lot of patience. And when you want results immediately, that's hard to do, right? But I think leaders that that show a sense of calm, right, and and that are especially in crises, right? And hey, that's exactly where communications comes in handy is dealing with crises. If you can approach it with a calm demeanor. If you can help people understand that you've got their back, that you're getting answers, that you're open and transparent about it, um, and that you're consistent in your communications, it helps people to uh, to understand where you're coming from and, and, and to put confidence and trust in your leadership. Um, but ultimately, when it comes to, you know, when, when it comes to like one of the most important uh, aspects of, of leadership, um, I, I really think, going back to what you said before, empathy, um, at taking the time to understand the other and to understand the, the dignity behind each human being. Uh, this, this is part of the, the, that book that I held up before, the, the Extraordinary Power of Leader Humility. Um, mm -hmm. That's humility, not, not in terms of thinking uh, poorly of yourself or, or, or putting yourself down, but humility in terms of uh, acknowledging humanity and acknowledging the dignity of others and being able to respect them. That's what people admire about great leaders. And, and that example I gave about Alan inviting us up there, he recognized the dignity of my two boys and didn't have to, but expressed it to us in such a way that really made us think of him as a great leader. I'm, I'm intrigued. If you, first of all, I guess I'd love to know, do you think it's possible to still be a great leader and remove any one of those qualities? And if so, uh, I, you know, I'd love to know uh, which one it, which one it would be. I think there's one that, for me, and I won't say what mine is, but I think there's one that you just have to have this one, or it just doesn't doesn't work. Uh, but I'd be interested to see, um, you know, if there's if there's any that you think you can you'd be a little flexible on, you know. Yeah. I'd argue, um, I'd argue humility. You, I know you can be a, a truly great leader without being humble, and I'm a big, big believer in humble leaders, but I think you could probably skate the edges of that one a little bit. You start seeing the Elon Musk or whatever of the world, maybe not the most humble dudes on earth, um, or even um, you know Steve Jobs, uh, but but you know they're probably they were probably still perceived as great leaders on some level, but I but I think there's some totally essential you cannot remove from the equation. Yeah, I, I, I it, that's hard because you think about all of those uh, individually, and it's it's hard to think of a leader that doesn't have some element, some element that, that doesn't have to be you know a huge part of their personality, but that, that doesn't have some element of it. I mean, you want your your leaders to have integrity. You want them to show gratitude. Uh, you want them to be more positive than negative on balance. Um, you know, you, you're never going to get uh, somewhere by someone who is always down and negative and, um, you know, simply hard charging. That, again, you, you think back to the earlier part of the conversation where we talked about um, building the long term there and, and shooting your shot, um, being more than a one trick pony. Um, you, you want somebody who can kind of um, extend the team and, and keep people around. Right. And, 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 and work on retention. I think all of these are essential. Uh, around that. But to, to your point about humility, I think the way we've traditionally thought about humility in, in terms of uh, someone who is uh, prideful and bragging about their, uh, their, their, their achievements. Yeah, we see a lot of, of uh, type A leaders who are like that because you don't get somewhere by sitting back and just waiting for greatness to be bestowed on you. You pursue it, right? And, and it, it typically we don't think of people as humble who are out there pursuing that kind of thing. I think you, but, I mean, you take like a Warren, a Warren Buffett's a shockingly humble. It hey, really is. Like that. Uh, but then I, I'd say the one, the one that deal breaker for me is I think you can have a little wiggle room. Uh, ideally a perfect leader is, you know, 10, you know, eight out of eight, nine or out of 10 on all these things. Yeah. I have no um, tolerance for any kind of shift on uh, being a great leader on integrity. Mm. It, it, like, if you, like I've just no, there's just no wiggle room on that one for agree. me. Agree, agree. 
I mean, you, that that's not that's like being half pregnant. You can't be yeah, yeah, you know half yeah, full yeah, of yeah, integrity. You, <laughs> halfway on that, and right. I don't know if that says I have shows I have trust issues or not, but I just like I that's the big thing for me. I like if I don't if I don't trust someone, um, it's 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 done. I don't do business with people like that. I don't work with people like that, and I certainly can't follow someone like that. Yeah, agree. Uh, totally agree with you on that. It, so, so Scott, I want to be conscious of time today. We got through a big chunk of these. This is one of my favorite O-Ship episodes ever, for the record. I think we should do this again. We agree. We group in, a, in, a, in a month or whatever makes sense. I think we've got more questions. I've got, more, I've got even more I've been jotting down kind of in my head. And I think we could do a follow-up to this episode. That would be totally awesome. Um, and, and I think we should end on a high note. It's been super inspiring. I hope I, I, I'm inspired by your answers. I hope our audience has been inspired by the conversation. We've had really, really great engagement today uh, across all of our social channels. And I just want to thank you for coming on our ship. And for those of you who are on Timeless Leadership, thank you for letting me uh, join Scott Scott this week. Uh, Scott, will you uh, quickly uh, kind of express where people can find Timeless Leadership and, and how to subscribe to your podcast? Sure. If you go to www.timelesstimely.com, that's uh, the home of the newsletter and the podcast. You can see the episodes listed out there. And of course, it's on every single podcast distribution channel that you can imagine. Awesome. And for those of you who enjoy your ship, Go to oshipshow.com and you can watch all of our live uh, YouTube videos there or you can follow us on LinkedIn um, and, or even on the Chameleon uh, Twitter account or even on uh, Chameleon Collective's uh, Facebook account to catch the show live every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern or to watch the show um, after it's been broadcast. I want to, uh, again, a very massive special thanks to Scott for, for joining me today. Thank you for everyone that's watched. And I uh, hope to see you again on another week of O-Ship or on Timeless Leadership. Bye, everyone.